You know, there has never been a better time to review our podcast, or any of your favourite podcasts, in fact. For every review you write, Podchaser is donating 25 pence to the Ukraine relief effort being made by the Disasters Emergency Committee. Leaving a review on Podchaser is free, but every review you write for one of our podcasts is actually worth a donation of 50 pence. Just click the link in our show notes, or search for Happily Ever Teaching at podchaser.com. And don't forget to review our sister podcast too, Fables and Fairy Tales. That way you'll send even more to support the Ukraine relief efforts. Right now, though, it only remains for me to say the warmest of greetings to you, so... The warmest of greetings to you, and welcome to Happily Ever Teaching! This is the podcast to help you enthrall your learners in every subject under the sun using the best teaching method known to science, storytelling. To do this, we feature special guest educators who are passionately keen for your children to become amazing and successful human beings. I am storyteller Chip Cahoon, and with me today is... Hi, I'm Toria Bono. I am a primary teacher in a junior school on the South Coast. I currently teach Year 4, and I'm also the host of the podcast Tiny Voice Talks. Lovely to be here. Hi, I'm Helen. I'm a teacher in Buckingham Sheds, currently teaching reception and Year 1 children. And we're very pleased to have you, our listener, with us as we explore personal social health and emotional education with a Colombian folktale. So for all the fun and effectiveness of story-led learning, let's don our finest hats, sprinkle some fairy dust, and hang tight to our magic carpet as we dive into this week's story. When a young girl wishes to marry a prince, she is of course overjoyed when her wish is granted. But her two older sisters become overjealous. So the scheming siblings contrive to be there when the new princess is about to give birth, ready to exact their revenge. Little do they know that their mischief could be about to let another wish come true. When the time came for the princess to give birth, she held the prince's hand and looked straight into his smiling eyes. So neither prince nor princess noticed the sisters take the baby before they could see it and swap it for a puppy. As the sisters passed her the puppy, the princess' eyes opened as wide as her gasping mouth, as did the prince's. They both thought the princess really had given birth to a baby dog. It was most unexpected but still they cared for the puppy and cuddled the puppy and gave it food and walks and a cot after all as far as they knew the puppy was their child so they loved it with all their hearts as for their actual baby the sisters placed him into a basket and sent him down the river They weren't mean enough to kill him themselves, so they thought they'd let some crocodiles do that for them. Except the basket didn't get as far as any crocodile nest. It happened to float past the house of a gardener while his wife was hanging up their washing in the garden. And when the gardener's wife spotted it, she almost leapt as high as their house. She waded into the river to recover the basket and brought it straight to the kitchen where the gardener was finishing his breakfast. Husband, she cried, look, our wish has been granted. And if you and your young learners want to see if the princess is ever reunited with her actual offspring, you can download our sister podcast, Fables and Fairy Tales, or search our website, epictales.co.uk, for basket babies. 
There you'll find a video of me telling the story that you can share with your children. And if you sign up as an Epic Educator, you'll also get a copy as an ebook or paperback, as well as the full audiobook for you to download at any time. There are even some tips for telling the story yourself and a whole heap of resources to go with the lesson ideas we're about to discuss, as well as extra lesson ideas that we didn't have time to fit into this podcast. Right now, though, let's begin our discussion with Helen and Toria here by asking, folks, did you find this story to be a basket of goodies? I found it to be utterly hilarious, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah, me too. It just seemed to go from <laughs> one bizarre notion to the next, then on to the next. And I was actually, I was, now this sounds a bit obscure, but I was having my nails done and reading it aloud to the person that was doing my nails, <laughs> who was just in hysterics listening to the story. Because it does, it just seems to go, you can't even predict where it's going. And when the stick appears... Honestly, at that point, I was just creased <laughs> up. So I don't know about you, Helen, but I thought it was just geniusly bizarre. <laughs> uh, do you know, I was going to say something very similar. It was <laughs> bizarrely brilliant. This well, you story. were having your nails done too. Had, um, unfortunately <laughs> not. Um, my, oh, my nails are very much of the pony owning person variety. <laughs> um, ah. But if I were to have had my nails done, I'm sure I would have <laughs> <laughs> shared the story. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I thought it was bizarre, but brilliant. Um, it had all the elements that I love in a story, especially the three really nasty, <laughs> really nasty sisters plotting. Mm. And then obviously the the happily ever after, after that I always enjoy. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was so funny. As you said, Tori, you didn't know what was going to come next. No, you couldn't have predicted it. That's the great thing about this story. There's absolutely no way that you could predict, could have predicted hmm. at any point what was going to come next. No, and I think I think you're both kind of hinting at some of the reasons why this is quite genuinely one of my favourite stories <laughs> to tell. Um, and I, I get asked a lot of the time, you know, about my favourite story. And my answer is usually that it's the story that I'm telling in the moment, because I always mm. feel you have to absolutely be 100% behind whichever story you are telling so that your audience get behind whatever story you're telling. Mm. But whenever I am telling this story, I find that the easiest to do. And yeah. I think, <laughs> Helen, you, you sort of um, brought up the fact that there are some very key storytelling tropes in this that we find a lot, like the the Wicked Sisters, like the, the yeah. substitution, yeah. like the substitute parents as well. But they are toyed around with and they don't quite go the way that you expect. And even though you've still got things happening sort of in threes, you're kind of left hanging right till the very end to find what's going to what's tie it all happen, together yeah. at the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And of course, for me, one of the things that makes it a great story is the theme at its heart, which is the reason why we have picked it for exploring foster care fortnight with your children, yeah. which is coming up very, very soon. Because I do think that having children understand that stepmothers and foster carers and substitute parents are not always wicked but as they yeah. might go around thinking if their only experience mm. is the you know the the ugly sisters of cinderella or the wicked stepmother of snow white this is such an important fairy tale for reminding people that really family can extend beyond just blood relatives and you can still be just as close and as much inspiration and important relationships with them. I loved I love that element of it, Chip, actually. I've put um for one of the ideas for later talking about families. Mm. Um, and just the fact that this at the heart of this story is that family that's growing down the river <laughs> yeah. and that everyone's being embraced and taken in as part of the family and growing as part of the family. And we've just got that sort of contrast with the the, the sneaky wickedness that might be going on the other end of the river mm. <laughs> down one end of the river you've got this lovely family growing and such warmth and happiness yeah the, the moral isn't particularly hidden in the story is it it's kind of put out there um very very overtly you know if you help others they'll help yeah. you um but it does take a long time to perhaps realize exactly how and where that's happening in the story did you detect any other morals going on or other i suppose we'd call them pshe lessons going on wouldn't we something that i found really interesting throughout was actually in a sense unpicking what makes us happy mm. because the sisters were determined to destroy the princess's happiness 
from the mm. get go. As soon as she yeah. married the prince, they were determined we're gonna we're going to demolish her happiness. And actually, they tried so hard, but nothing actually destroyed her happiness. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah, you know, and this is one of the things I thought about for a PSHE lesson. Actually, what is happiness? You know, is happiness something that we get from things? You know, what brings happiness? Is it that something that we get through some things, or is it just a sense of being? And actually, I, I'm I'm really interested. I'd be interested with children about unpicking what makes them happy. You know, mm. do they need things around them to be happy? Do they need people around them? Do they need, you know? And I thought every time something awful happened to the princess, or that I would perceive to be awful, mm. she didn't embrace it with any sense of unease. She just embraced it with a sense of happiness and just felt so grateful for all that she had. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah I've, I've never really thought that deeply about it, but that would be a lovely one to go into. And and asking children as well what they think the phrase happily ever after means. Because mm. I think you, yeah, that... you both used it there and, and uh, about the ending of this story. Um, and yet one of the things that inspired me to tag on those little things about, you know, what, what the dog did next and what the kitten and the stick did next mm. um, was because you know, when you get to the end of a story, kids are often so in love with the characters that they want to go on and yeah. tell a sequel or, you know, have another adventure. And even Disney are guilty of this because they'll do the happily ever after and then they'll they'll chuck out a Cinderella 2 straight to VHS as it was <laughs> in my day, <laughs> or straight to DVD as it is now. So people want to stick around with the characters. So what, what does happily ever after actually mean? There's a really good link with the start of the story there, isn't there? Because with the wishes and what would you wish yes. for? Yeah. And um, the um, third sister wishes to marry a prince, but actually, is that what's making her happy in the end? Because quite often there's that cliche, isn't there? Marry, marry yeah. a prince, become a princess or a queen and, and you'll be happy. And I guess the, the other sisters are jealous because they think she's got, but she's got it all because she's a princess. But as you said, Tori, mm. that's not, that's not necessarily what makes her happy in the end. I think that's a really interesting thing to explore. What I found interesting about that, the three wishes, was that the princess didn't give a reason why she wanted to marry the prince. And I don't know mm. whether that was done on purpose or not. But the elder sister wanted to marry a builder because she mm -hmm. was the most exquisite house in the, the town. Mm. The second sister wanted to marry a fisherman because she always wanted food on her table. The third sister just wanted to marry a prince. But it gave no reason as to why. Mm. So, and I, you know, I wondered, well, I, why did she want to marry a prince? Was it that she wanted the title <laughs> princess? Was it because she wanted worldly riches? But actually, as you go through the story and then pick her and her character, there's a real understanding of actually those weren't things that she was terribly interested in. Maybe, maybe she had just read all of the stories saying that if you marry a prince, you'll be happily ever after. Happily and ever after, yeah. That's it was a... that thought that got her through all of the, the weird and bizarre things that happened later on in the tale. Or maybe she just bumped into him in the local village, fell madly and passionately <laughs> in love and thought, that's who I need to marry. That's almost yeah, a whole other um, discussion, isn't it, that you could have, yeah. particularly with um, <laughs> yeah. younger, like younger children often, you know, she'll talk about what do you want to... I had a discussion with the class not long ago. What What do you want to be? And you know, some of the girls said, mm. "Oh, we want to be a princess." So it'd be interesting just to ask them. Oh, why? <laughs> why yes. do you want to be? A, why do you want to marry? Why? And just see if they actually come up with a a reason. Or yeah, that would be interesting. Well, I think and, you know, with older children, often at the moment, you know, what do you want to be? I want to be I'll be an Instagrammer. I want to be a YouTuber. Yeah. But mm. why? Why do why? you want to be that? What is it that you want? Is it fame? Is it money? What is mm. it? Mm. I don't know if children have unpicked it that deeply. I don't know if we unpick it that deeply. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I personally wanted to be a brain surgeon at one point till I realized I didn't like the sight of blood. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> going to be uh, something that definitely turns you off or makes it <laughs> difficult anyway. <laughs> And we do have a, another story that we've looked at, very similar concept. I, I think you were with us, Helen, weren't you, when we looked at Huff McTuff, uh, the story yes. about the, the princess and the giant. And um, she is a princess and she's wanting to go out and do things with people and, and do little odd jobs around the castle. And she's not allowed because she's a princess. I think that rings uh, a bell, yeah. Of, 
yeah letting people uh, letting letting children see the limitations um that mm. they get with their desires and i'm sure there are limitations to being an instagrammer and a youtuber that um, <laughs> children maybe don't know or don't think of yeah <laughs> so. Are there any other uh, PSHE activities then that we can find in this story for, let's start at the lower end of the school and work our way up. So four to seven year olds, that's where we'll start with with you, Helen. Have you uh, any activities for that age range? Well, actually, um, it, it follows on really quite nicely from what we've just been talking about, um, because mm-hmm. I thought it'd be a good opportunity to talk about what do children want to be? I looked at it from a slightly different angle mm-hmm. at the start when the sisters are, are making their wishes. And the first sister wants a build a husband. Is that the right order? That's right. To yeah. live in the finest house. And the second sister wants a fisherman husband to eat the finest food. I thought that'd be a good opportunity to talk about you know, jobs. You know, you could almost retell that first part of the story and say to the children, well, who would you like to marry? What skills would you like them to have? Your husband or your mm-hmm. wife to have? What And use that in, in a, is a very early years kind of topic that's often done is is people who help us jobs jobs that um, people do mm. so I thought yeah. that would be a good a good way to discuss that open up that start that start the story to some other wishes you know more there's more wishes so who else could we wish for <laughs> and yeah. what would their role be you could do and you know as usual you could do some some role play with it you could even um if you had a bit more time you could get some different people in from the community that do different jobs um, mm. and explore it from that that angle as well so that was one of the the thoughts that I had which yeah, like linked nicely. Marvelous into what if you could get about. a princess in. It would be marvelous if you could get a princess in, an actual <laughs> real princess that doesn't necessarily wear <laughs> wear frocks. <laughs> mm. That would be good actually if you get an actual princess in. This is what an actual princess is. You can mm. definitely write to them, can't you? And yes. uh, I, they they do reply. I mean, uh, they they may not reply personally. They they may have a team doing it for them. But, um, <laughs> they may not reply to every letter. But yeah, if you, if you write to the royals, and I know this from personal experience, you do get a reply back. So it's definitely something that's worth doing with your children. I think my children would love doing that. I'm definitely magpieing that idea. <laughs> <laughs> and then a couple of other sort of PSHE activities. Yeah. Um, or even just discussions. Some of them are more just a chat, I think, but they're worth worth dropping in there. Mm-hmm. So it was slightly bizarre, obviously, in the story that the princess, as it were, gives birth to a puppy, a kitten and a stick. And as mm. Toria uh, was saying earlier about um, how the princess just sort of rolls with it, she includes everyone. And I thought this mm. was a really good theme of the story, was just including everyone, whether it's the princess including her unexpected puppy, kitten and stick and just embracing yeah. them as part of the family and not minding that they maybe weren't quite what she expected. Or it's the couple at the end of the river just embracing everyone that comes their way. Um, yeah. I think that's a lovely theme of the story, sort of that, that inclusion and letting everyone be involved. And it's something we talk about a lot in primary schools, you know, including everybody and differences. And um, I thought that was quite a, a nice way into it because this is such a great story for, for families as we were talking about, for, for the idea that a family isn't necessarily one, one specific way of family. There's yeah. lots of different families. Families take different forms. Um, and I think this is a wonderful story for discussing different children's families and a great opportunity for those children that, that may be looked after, maybe adopted, to actually maybe talk about it a bit in, in their yeah. class and those experiences. And you could yeah. do all kinds of things about families. Um, I've done before, you know, you can get families to send in photos, family photographs for the children to mm-hmm. then talk about. And then they can do some artwork of their own family in sort of a frame to go up on the wall. And that's really um, special to the children because then they've got, it brings home into the classroom and, you know, they yes, sort of can often yeah. talk about the pictures that are on the wall. Yeah, I mean, we do that so much when we go off to, to our own offices, you know, we, we have little pictures of our, our family there um, to, you know, help us get through the mm. day. And, well, why can't we let our, our children have those sorts of things to get through their school day? I think that's a beautiful idea. Yeah, absolutely. The ch- children really like it. Um, and then you can take it as far as you like, you know, you can include some artwork, you know, do some some sort of painted portraits as in the style of yeah. of um, some some family, you know, maybe more. I was in a country house the other day, you know, the family portraits that go on the wall. You could do something mm-hmm. in the style of those and you were so inclined. Uh, but you can take yeah. this idea of families 
quite quite far. Yeah. And I think, again, coming back to the fact that foster care fortnight is on the horizon, mm. it's so useful to have that discussion with this story and to, to have that discussion with your children. Because I think when you are in foster care, you're sort of not quite adopted, you're, you're not quite in a, a step home, and you can end up moving from one family to another quite often because, you know, the families don't feel like they fit. And I do wonder if part of that is because there is this pervasive idea in society that there's something wrong about being with parents who aren't actually your parents, Mm. which, yeah, we do find a lot in fairy tales. And being able to have a tale like this to put the total counterpoint to that view could be really, really beneficial to children who are going through the experience of foster care. Because we don't often think about it from the child's point of view. And I think this is this is a fantastic way to explore that. Definitely. You know, you could use those um the idea of those three babies going down the down the stream mm. and then when they arrive at their new home, what's it like for them? What how do they feel? What's that experience like for them and how how do their new mum and dad help them to feel at home and what's home like for them then? So, yeah, it's yeah. a fantastic story for that. How would you explore those sorts of themes with the older ages then, Tori, as we go up to 7 to 11? Well, connecting on from what Helen was saying, actually, the whole thing about family, I think is really important. And I'd be really interested, first of all, in, in creating a family tree based on the story. Oh. So what mm. makes up? The families in the story, because actually there's a real complexity about Mm. who belongs to who and so on. And actually, where do you place the two princes and princesses that were born and yet ended up with the gardener and his wife? Mm. And, you know, then you've got the stick, the puppy and the kitten. And I'd be really interested. There's a literal family tree in there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes, literally. So creating that, and I think that would lend to quite a lot of talk about the relationships within and then children creating their own family tree because I think when children create their own family tree they begin to get a a, a greater understanding of their own heritage Mm. I think with year sixes you know year five year sixes you could really take it back to grandparents per se but I also think really interesting discussions can come up from this regarding step siblings half Mm -hmm. siblings being adopted and being fostered and actually what those family trees may look like because I think you know we live in a very very diverse society and one in which 50 years ago we'd have expected a family tree to look pretty I don't know pretty simple as such yeah, pretty tree like yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah the complexities nowadays are mm. immense I have taught children who have had many step and half siblings. I've taught foster children. I've taught adopted children. And the thing is that in order to create our own identity, we need to know where we come from. Mm. We need to know who we are. And in a sense, creating a family tree, I think, would enable children to do that, but would also enable them to talk a bit about it. Yeah. If they so chose. And what I have found is whenever I've done something like that, children have wanted to talk about it. But I mm. think it would have to be done in a very careful manner in, it, in which it would be, you don't need to share your family tree. This is your family tree. It's up to you whether you want to talk about it, you want to share it. Yeah. Because I think sometimes children don't want to. Mm. Giving them that knowledge that they don't have to share it. Yeah. Yeah. would probably help them to yeah. almost take on the activity more, to actually get more out of that, to hold back less if they know that they don't have to talk about it if they don't want to. Yeah. yeah. I think sometimes it's really important. I think I've taught very young children to much older children. And what I've found is that as you go up the age ranges, they become more aware of their peers and more mm. conscious of wanting to fit in per se and not stand out and something like, you know, and our family trees are very personal because they're going to look different from everyone else's family tree. And that's mm. why I think, you know, some children will be very keen to talk about it, but others won't want yeah. to. Yeah. I wonder, uh, I mean, a couple of ideas have popped into my head listening to you bring up this idea, Toria, which um, one, one of them was to think about 
or how we take on characteristics from mm. other members of our family. And I mm. wondered whether you could um, encourage your children to have a look at the various people on their family tree, the ones that they know well enough to be able to say a quality about them that they really like. So they can think of, you know, what positive qualities do they see in their, their mother or in their father, their grandma, their uncles, their aunties, etc. And then pick which of those they nice. want to take into themselves. Yeah, so, great idea. Yeah. And as, as you sort of expanded on Toya's idea, Helen, I, I wondered as well whether, I don't know, do you think it would be dangerous to, to turn it into a friendship tree and actually have children starting to, to link themselves by their friendships, both um, within and without the school, maybe across classes, maybe mm. um, friends that they have, you know, coming to visit them back at home? I can see a little danger there if you have any children who maybe do feel isolated in your classroom. But I can also see this as potentially positive for them if they do have friends at home or if they have family members that they see at home um, so that others are able to look and see that their tree is, is just as big uh, once they start including friends from outside of the yeah. school. One of the things that we do in year four for PSHC is we actually really look at people who influence us, people in our lives and so on, people mm. that we go to, including, you know, so if children are members of scout groups or guide groups, actually the leaders there tend to be quite influential in their lives. So it's not just about friendships per se, but also yeah. who is it? Who influences us in our life? Who do we go to? And I think the interesting thing there is that it isn't necessarily always family that we go to. There are external mm -hmm. forces, which I think is what you're alluding to, Chip. Yeah, yeah. And so, so a, a kind of influence tree almost yeah. as, a, as, as an extended activity. And if you bring it back to the story, would you have gone to the sisters? Yes. W would you have wanted to include part of their quality in mm. yours? As we're sort of talking about extended families, often what's really lovely is if children can have those other adults in their lives that aren't actually their family family um mm. but are so influential on them and mean that much to yeah. them um that they're given a chance to actually think about that and include them on a, on a family tree because yeah. you know maybe even children that maybe don't don't have good relationships with their parents but they have influences from all these other adults around them even um I, a few years ago I taught a little girl whose mum had very sadly died when she was three years old mm. her aunt had a huge role in her life you know her aunt was supporting her dad and her aunt brought her to school and picked her up and just think about those adults as well that that children might include as their close family whether it's aunts or friends or <laughs> any anyone yeah. that's around and um, so that'd be yeah. really really good way for children to actually see that their family goes beyond maybe yeah their their house <laughs> yeah and I think we we do actually do this um even in general day-to-day -day life sometimes mm. without even thinking about it because um we, you know we we may have friends who become the aunts and uncles to our children you know yeah. our, our children end up calling yeah. them auntie well I, I'm actually auntie chip um, <laughs> to, <laughs> to the son of a, a couple of friends of ours so yeah I, th I think this is a a brilliant activity thank you so much folks that's all we have time for today, folks. If you try out any of these ideas, or if you'd like us to help you teach a topic you are soon to cover with your young learners, let us know on social media using at Teach Happily, or leave us a review using your favorite podcast app. Please also share this podcast with your colleagues and help us start a story-led revolution in classrooms around the world, so children everywhere can learn in a way that's effective, memorable, and enjoyable all at the same time. Tomorrow, the gardener and his family will help us teach English. But right now, it only remains for us to say cheerio, and we hope to hear your story soon. So, cheerio! And, and we, we hope, hope to hear your, your story, story soon! You know, there has never been a better time to review our podcast, or any of your favourite podcasts, in fact. For every review you write, Podchaser is donating 25 pence to the Ukraine relief effort being made by the Disasters Emergency Committee. Leaving a review on Podchaser is free, but every review you write for one of our podcasts is actually worth a donation of 50 pence. Just click the link in our show notes, or search for Happily Ever Teaching at podchaser.com, and don't 
don't forget to review our sister podcast too, Fables and Fairy Tales. That way you'll send even more to support the Ukraine relief efforts. Thank you ever so much.